Hello, my name is Jacob Avila of Core Ultrasound, and in this Core Ultrasound image review, we have a special guest, Mike Macias from the Emergent Medical Associates. Did yeah, I get it right? That's right. right that nice, time. man. Sweet. Yeah, I need to I need to actually like remember how to say it correctly because it's actually the group that I work for as well. I recently moved from Kentucky to California, and honestly, Mike kind of got me this job, so thank you, Mike. Oh, of course, that. man. I really Anytime. appreciate that. Yeah. Mike is the uh, ultrasound director for basically like a group of hospitals over here. And we are going to go through some cases that he's had over the past few months to years and kind of just talk about them. Now, I know that I'm talking about Mike as the ultrasound director for EMA, but also the way we kind of met was via Twitter due to the Pocus Atlas, which is a great website that I would 100% recommend checking out. Mike, thanks for uh, doing this with us. Thanks for having me, man. I'm super excited. One, for you to be in California yeah, here with yeah, me. I know we've been, you know, talking via the Twitter sphere mm -hmm. and working both on education content, you know, the Core Ultrasound, the Pocus Atlas. Yep. I feel like we've known about each other. We've sort of had some collaborations here and there mm -hmm. and really excited to have you in California. One, to collaborate on educational ultrasound projects like this, and then two, as a colleague. So awesome, man. excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to be back. Uh, let's go through a couple of cases. So this is our first case here, and I think it's kind of a, a classic case, right? We have a gallbladder uh, right here in the middle. We have a good gallstone. It's a transverse view. It looks like it might be in the neck. I'm not 100% sure. But there's a couple of extra things that I think that we can talk about here besides the obvious present of this uh, hypo, uh, excuse me, hyperechoic stone with a shadowing deep to it. Mike, what are some other kind of like learning points that we can take from this image? I think the first thing I'm seeing is I'm just watching that like subcostal sweep that I'm seeing that kind of mm -hmm. is telling me that they're actually, this was a nice uh, technical uh, obtained view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you can see the liver tip here. Um, towards the right side of the screen. Um, so this is telling me the head's over here. Mm -hmm. This is anterior, right? And this is deep. So they have the probe placed in a parasagittal orientation and they're sort of sweeping across the liver tip. And that's usually the best way to find the gallbladder. Mm -hmm. So I really liked the technique there. As you can see, I'm moving through. We do have a little bit of a rib shadow coming in, but I think with um, biliary right upper quadrant ultrasound that's always going to be right. something that we're going to have to deal with and um, that could be moved out of the way by just kind of bringing the probe down a little bit more off of the ribs mm -hmm. but sometimes that's the only view you're going to get and so right. you kind of have to work between those rib spaces um, other things I'm seeing on this view is one we definitely can identify that gallstone and just remembering that gallstones are going to be dependent um, so we can see this person I'm assuming is laying flat and so we can see that gallstone posteriorly um, with a hyperechoic surface with shadowing is which to mm -hmm. me is what defines a gallstone mm -hmm. the other things that I'm starting to see though is just as they're sweeping through is this gallbladder wall looks a little bit abnormal it looks thickened to me yeah. um, so I definitely want to investigate that a little bit more I don't know if there's some other images coming up yeah, and the, the one thing that I always wonder about, like we always teach not to measure the posterior wall. And the reason for that, I believe, is uh, because we don't want to overestimate the size due to posterior acoustic enhancement. But the other thing to kind of keep in mind is that sometimes you can actually have focal thickening, uh, which can be a actual like sign of um, cancer when you have like focal thickening of the gallbladder wall rather than like diffuse thickening of the gallbladder wall. So if the posterior, like you're like pretty sure that the border is here and the border is there, sometimes it's okay to measure it. Um, this actually is, I think this is the same one. This might be a different one. It looks very similar. Yeah. It might be the exact same one, just with the depth a little bit deeper. Um, and you can see kind of uh, consistently that there is a pretty thickened wall kind of mm -hmm. all the way around. I can see it a little bit better in the deep, uh, more dependent portion of it just because of the posterior acoustic enhancement. And so I kind of struggle with like, should I measure back here? Or should I measure up here? I think that you probably would be most safe measuring more up here rather than down here because it could be artificially increased. The other thing that I like about this is the uh, very big amount of posterior acoustic enhancement, which is a, a bit of an artifact. So if you look over here, this is much brighter than uh, over here. And this is of course, apart from that rib shadow, which darkens everything, of course. 
Um, but this is because that there is no attenuation of sound through that gallbladder. So that's why we're seeing it much brighter over here than over here. It's not like this is more echogenic at baseline. It's just posterior acoustic enhancement. Now, we should talk about this measurement. Mm -hmm. It's a great measurement. Absolutely. It was done in the anterior wall. But what do you think could have been done a little bit better with this? Um, I'm seeing one just looking at that gallbladder wall, right? I, I, that looks very abnormal to me. So before we even get to the technical aspect, yeah. generally when I'm just teaching residents to look at the gallbladder wall, mm -hmm. it's usually I'm describing you really don't see it, right? You rarely right. see much of the gallbladder wall. Mm -hmm. yeah, Thin, yeah. tiny little right. line that's a little bit brighter mm -hmm. um, than the liver tissue. But here there's something very thick surrounding that gallbladder. Again, just looking at this area mm -hmm. here that is definitely catching my eye. But yeah, one thing I did notice is I think we may actually be underestimating the size of this. You can see the calipers here from here to here saying that this is 0.66, so definitely mm -hmm. large. Yeah. We're looking at less than three to four mm -hmm. millimeters. Um, but look at the axis of this measurement. It looks like it's a little bit tangential, yeah, a little um, right? It's oblique. What I mm -hmm. like to do is measure completely perpendicular to the mm -hmm. axis of the gallbladder. Yeah. So if I was actually measuring this, I'd probably start here and probably come down to about here, right? right? So I think we are underestimating it. Mm -hmm. In this case, it didn't matter because it's obviously a very large gallbladder mm -hmm. wall. So mm -hmm. uh, in the right clinical setting, I'd be worried about cholecystitis. Um, but yeah, definitely want to make sure you're getting perpendicular um, to the axis of that wall to make sure you're getting an accurate measurement. Agreed. Good call. Now, this is gonna be kind of like a hodgepodge, right? There's like a lot of different types of ultrasounds here. I'm so excited about this one. This is a posterior tibial block. This right here is the tibia. I was talking to Arun uh, the other day were negative, and he was saying that like, you shouldn't call it a posterior tibial because there's no anterior tibial really yeah. that we care about. And apparently anesthesiologists really don't like that, so they want us to say just tibial nerve. It's just the tibial nerve block. I, yeah, whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think so. The tibial nerve is what I should have said. This is the tibial nerve at the medial ankle, and what's really cool is that this is a great example of why the landmark-based approach is something you can do, but it's probably not the best idea. The reason that this is not the best idea is this is anterior, this is posterior, this is the nerve, and the blood vessels in this case are actually posterior. Normally, it's the other way around that the um, nerve is actually going to be posteriorly. And if you did this blind, you would a completely miss the nerve. So let's say you felt a good pulse back there and you went posterior to it, it would completely miss the nerve. So it'd be Absolutely. a completely failed block, or you might accidentally get this inside the artery, which you also don't want to do. So this is like perfect example of one of the reasons besides the increased accuracy of placing it, decreased pain, all that stuff. Why you want to use your ultrasound is because of this, because people have anatomic variations. And this provider actually came from the anterior approach. I think it's really great. And you can see that needle kind of coming in there and getting right into that sheath. Um, the second view right here, we're a little out of plane with the needle, but we can see the spread of that anesthetic just right around that nerve. So pretty uh, cool uh, block. And honestly, this is one of my, I call these like my gateway blocks. I just mm -hmm. think that they're, they're pretty uh, low risk for the most part. Are you doing a lot of these types of blocks? Um, actually, yes, I would say that this to me was my gateway block. Um, when I was in residency, mm -hmm. we actually didn't really have a lot of formal nerve block training. And mm -hmm. this was the block, you know, I had a foreign body stuck in the foot, which, you know, in the, oh, man, the planter so aspect, which is numb, like, the, yeah, it's, this is the block for that, right? right? Trying to pick at the bottom of the foot yeah. Yeah. and inject lo local uh, anesthetic into the bottom of the foot is painful. Dang, um, so, so this definitely showed me the proof of concept mm -hmm. of nerve blocks. And I like it because uh, it's fairly low risk. There is that artery, the posterior tibial mm -hmm. artery, which usually is anterior, but again, we can see it over here. Mm -hmm. um, but I like it because it's close to the skin. You can usually get a pretty good in-plane approach to it. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen people do the out-of-plane approach with it, and um, some people swear by it because sometimes if you are coming from a yeah. posterior aspect, that Achilles tendon can sort of get in right. your way. It's especially if they don't have uh, a lot of tissue. If they have like a lot of tissue, it's really easy to do in the long axis. But if they don't have a lot of tissue, it's really hard to get the transducer. Um, you know, if this is like the, the leg, it's hard to get the transducer like that and make perfect contact. Whereas if you're like this, 
then you make you're making great contact with the skin. Like the one example where actually <laughs> right. having less yeah, yeah. fat uh, right. <laughs> or thickening actually is helpful. Is helpful. Yeah. 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 No, I, helps I us. Yeah. Um, the other thing is uh, this actually. Uh, I've done it once or twice for this. It's not the most common thing, but it actually works well for calcaneus fractures. I'm always like a little bit nervous about it because calcaneus fractures are at like a slightly higher risk of compartment syndrome. So I just make sure to, if I'm going to do it, um, I do it for pain control, let people know like, hey, just keep an eye on it and look at the foot, make sure you look for any signs of a compartment syndrome um, apart from the pain. Absolutely. All right, Mike, you're going to have to tell me about this case because I am I know this is the Achilles tendon. I see a little fluid, but I don't see a tear. So I'm trying to figure out, like, what is it that we're seeing here? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, so this was an interesting case. So um, this was a woman that came in, um, you know, you know middle-aged, mm -hmm. basically had been having increasing pain to the back of her heel for mm -hmm. two weeks. Okay. She was an avid walker. Um, okay. So she walked around quite a bit, you know, mm -hmm. went on her, her two, three-mile walk. Uh, every day and yeah. when we examined her you know obviously the first thing any uh emergency physician is like oh achilles tendon rupture right, right? we're right, always right. worried about the achilles we yeah. can't miss that diagnosis right. and so you know we did her thompson's test her mm -hmm. achilles was moving fine she had good plantar flexion mm -hmm. but the achilles was enlarged you know we were looking at both and it looked uh larger on one this, side than the other this down here too um, yeah so we threw the ultrasound on and on your left side is us the transverse view and we're mm -hmm. kind of sliding down through the attachment of the achilles to the calcaneus which is right there mm -hmm. and then this was our long axis view and the actual Achilles tendon, which you guys can see here, this nice fibrillar appearance, looked great, right? We could see its attachment all the way to, to the calcaneus, mm -hmm. but we saw this fluid, right, down here, and then we saw these hyperechoic densities here, and then also here. And we're like, well, this looks like calcifications. And, you know, she had inflammation to the tendon, classic signs of a tendonitis because whenever she stepped off it, it hurt. Yeah. So this was a, an ultrasound case of Achilles calcific tendonitis. And wow. so we I've were never able to- I've seen this. I had never diagnosed yeah. it in the emergency yeah. department, yeah. but when I, you know, I'm used to looking at tendons and seeing hyperechoic region areas in the tendon. I'm like, yeah. these are calcifications. Mm -hmm. uh, and sure enough, that's what it was. So. We actually just gave her a boot just to offload the Achilles for a little bit mm -hmm. uh, and had her follow up with ortho. Nice. Yeah, that's a pretty sweet diagnosis. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I say sweet diagnosis because I like seeing things, but I don't like patients having this. It's just, it's awesome that you were able to, to diagnose this, you know, with presumably minutes at the bedside without anything I think extra. I think that this is moving, you know, moving us forward in terms of being diagnosticians in the mm -hmm. emergency department. I think a lot of times patients like having a diagnosis and something that they right. can kind of take till they follow up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think this was really great to be able to tell her what's going on. Agreed. All right. So this is something that I think we see this, we see testicular complaints a decent amount, right? But we don't, I don't know, like I, I don't always do the point of care scans of the testicles. So that's what we're looking at here. Um, so I think the right side is more or less a normal testicle. And then on the left side, I'm seeing a lot more kind of flow, although this right here has a different echo texture from this. So I'm wondering if this even is testicle. Like, what is it that we're looking at over here, like, and that has all that increased flow in it? You know, Jacob, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure what we're looking at. <laughs> I was thinking, I mean, it doesn't, it definitely could be a... Um, uh, hernia, um, a, you know, like a, not hernia, um, uh, what is it called when you have the blood vessels, like the extra veins? Oh, varicoceles? Yeah, they could be varicoceles for sure, but I'm wondering if this is actually just like a inflamed epididymis. That's you know? kind of what I was thinking, yeah. um, without actually having any idea about where we're actually looking on this right. patient. Uh, I think we're seeing, at least if we're comparing, increased yeah. vascularity. Right. Um, so this may be, yep, that sort of bag of worms things that we see with the varicocele. Yeah. Um, but sometimes, you know, even us ultrasound directors, right? Sometimes it's hard to say what exactly uh, I'm looking at without seeing where the probe was placed. Hey, you have to clinically correlate sometimes. Clinically correlate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to clinically correlate this one. That's right. Flow is present. Uh -huh. uh, and there's some heterogeneous structure there. Right. Uh, but clinical correlation is, is needed. For right. Sure. Of course. And that's okay, right? I, I have so much more patience for when I see those off of CTs and x-rays and stuff. Because, like, I understand that now that just the image by itself, like 
you can't sometimes you need more data you need to actually like know the clinical situation i have become so much more sympathetic for that yeah. read yeah, when yeah. now that i review a lot of images for residents and providers and yeah. when you see that image and you're like okay like clinical correlate right thick and mm-hmm. gallbladder right like right. the case we just what talked about yeah Ascites, cirrhotic patient, mm-hmm. right? Was there a sonographic Murphy's, a gallstone? Yeah. Got to clinically correlate. Yep. So, yep. Agreed. respect for the radiologist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Like that gallbladder right. case that we saw, the one with the thickened wall. Like, yeah. what if that was just like chronic from like, yeah. I don't know, like ascites or, or volume overload state or something like that? Like, yeah, you got it. But if that same patient, that gallbladder patient, had like, you know, super high Y count, had elevated liver enzymes, and that is probably cholecystitis, right? Absolutely. We actually looked it up later and it turns out that that patient had a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis that showed a mass. We would have gotten follow-up, but unfortunately the patient eloped. So probably some kind of a mass, unfortunately. Just uh, kind of closing the loop on that. I will admit that testicles are not my forte. This was a really interesting case. So Mike, this is, I'll tell you the scenario. This guy comes in acutely dyspneic. We bring him in, vital signs are a little soft. I look at his echo, because that's usually where I start when someone looks this bad, and I see this. Now, it's not the best view. There was a lot of commotion around this patient, and we didn't have a lot of room to bring the cart base machine in there, so I was able to grab that butterfly and uh, get this scan in here. How would you diagnose this clinically unstable patient no previous medical history with this apical four. Like, what, what would you say? I mean, we, we've already talked about this, so you already know the answer, which I think is mm-hmm. like pretty cool. But what would you what would you say about this one? So the first thing I'm seeing is again, if I can just mm-hmm. um, show these chambers here. So let's just orient us. This is over here: our left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle. And mm-hmm. honestly, the biggest thing that's sticking out to me is the RV. Mm-hmm. Um, if I have a dyspneic patient, the first thing I'm seeing when I'm looking at this is I'm concerned about a pulmonary embolism, if this is sudden onset. Right. And what I'm seeing is, look at this RV free wall, right? It's not contracting at all. It's pretty and hypokinetic. Hypokinetic, yeah. great, this is exactly. And when you look at the apex of the RV, it's actually uh, contracting pretty well, and maybe mm-hmm. even hyper dynamic, right. right? More. Yeah. Uh, so then the rest of the RV wall. So there's a name for this, right? right. McConnell sign. Yeah, yeah. So we have a right heart enlargement with McConnell sign. Right heart enlargement, McConnell sign. I mean... So it's PE, right? It's PE. It's PE. It's PE. Yeah. Everybody says it's PE. Um, let's show everybody the EKG that we got after the echo. This is not super consistent with a PE, this wow. EKG, right? We're having some big... ST elevations in 2, 3, and AVF. We have depressions in 1 and AVL, so those are contiguous leagues. We also have depression in V2. This is an inferior MI. I mean, there's probably more than one blood vessel affected here. But this is crazy because we look at this clip here, and if we look at this in isolation, we'd say like, oh, this is definitely a PE because it's McConnell sign. But one of the things that I always teach is I always teach that McConnell sign is indicative of an acute right heart process. It's not necessarily an acute P every time. And this patient had a 100% RCA occlusion. So this was a right-sided MI with a McConnell sign, which I think is is pretty interesting. I mean, we have the EKG, so it really helped us out, but it's just it should give us pause to know that anything that causes an acute right heart problem is going to give you or might give you a McConnell sign. And and this patient had like multivessel disease, but the culprit lesion for this was the um, RCA occlusion. Wow. That's mind blowing. Yeah. I think that we train and learn the McConnell's is Mm -hmm. consistent with PE, but I think this case just really reminds me, we got to be thinking about other causes of acute right heart strain. Mm -hmm. Even our chronic pulmonary hypertension patients, they might have increased strain. We might see the McConnell's. This is the first time I've ever actually seen yeah. STEMI and McConnell's yeah. and I've read the papers that uh-huh. it can present from an inferior infarct yeah. and I really didn't believe it to be honest. Right. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't fit with my experience. So I'm really happy you shared this case. Uh, thanks, man. No, no worries. Uh, cool case. Uh, I think the reason why we don't see it in fairness to us and to the ultrasound world is because usually we get the EKG before we do the ultrasound. Yeah. And if that's the case, yeah. then like, I don't know, sometimes if we... I use ultrasound to help me in my clinical practice. And if I have a patient that has an obvious STEMI, 
I don't know. Like, I'm not always throwing the ultrasound transducer on there. I mean, there's times where, like, let's say the history started with crushing, you know, tearing back pain with an inferior STEMI. I'm going to ultrasound that person to look for a dissection as the possible cause of that STEMI. But if they have, like, a, an obvious, like, LAD lesion STEMI, like, I'm not always using that ultrasound because it's just not going to help them out. But there are times where this actually might be important to know. So, Absolutely. Sweet case. All right, so this right here, this is a patient that you had, which this is very rare. Like, I, I don't think that I've seen this really on ultrasound. Um, Mike, what are we seeing here? Yeah, so this was a wild case. So this was a patient that had came in. Um, they had fallen onto their right shoulder four days ago. Okay. So four days ago. So this is a tough patient, right? right this right. person was stoic. They're yeah. hoping that whatever had happened to their shoulder was going to, you know, was going to just get better. Of course. Um, but they had fallen onto their shoulder and, um, the patient, patient said that she had fallen and landed right on it and mm -hmm. since then has been unable to move it. She just mm -hmm. doesn't want to turn yeah. out. Yeah. Um, right. And so whenever people are telling me that, uh, usually a direct blow to the shoulder, I'm thinking proximal humerus fracture, right? Of course. Yeah. That's like the classic mechanism, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Fall onto the shoulder, can't move it, lots of pain, you know? And so I, I try to examine the shoulder and... There's really no external rotation going on, yeah. um, but it doesn't really look like an empty, right? An empty glenoid fossa, right? It's definitely not anteriorly dislocated. Right. Um, so and you have the you have the probe posterior. Yeah. Right? yeah. So what I did is we put the probe on posterior, and let's just go back. So this is the right shoulder. So just to orient everyone, this is medial, mm -hmm. this is lateral. So this is posterior, and this is anterior. So look at our glenoid here. Here's the surface of the glenoid. Right. And normally the shoulder should, the humerus should articulate like nicely with it. Right. Yeah. I can draw a line straight across from the articulation of the glenoid and the humeral head. But look at this. We're seeing this humeral head that was actually posteriorly displaced. Wow. So and it was a like, posterior dislocation. And it was a posterior dislocation. Interesting. So, and at first, honestly, I, I didn't really believe it because I hadn't seen it that much. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why, you know, I, it's, she's been going around with us for four days. Right. She's appeared fairly comfortable, yeah. um, but it was posteriorly dislocated. We can actually look at the uh, CT scan, actually, because yeah. we did end up CTing her because it was oh. a little bit confusing. Interesting. So this is this little guy right here is the reason why it was still out, right? Because it was getting kind of caught. And I guess, is that a um, hill sax deformity? That's a deformity, yeah. So what happened is... Wait, is that a hill sax or a bank card? I always get those confused. That's it. That's it, Hill Sax, right? I believe Hill Sax. Don't quote me on that. We'll okay. update the video this. later yeah, if we forgot. But yeah. yeah, there was a fracture right here. Yeah. But look at this. This was the issue. Yep. So she could not externally rotate because you can imagine if you tried to externally rotate, the humerus would turn this way. And look at this. It was it's stuck. Yeah. It was caught. So um, we tried actually doing this um, without sedation, but... Yeah. Uh, she wasn't tolerating it, mm -hmm. um, even with uh, a block. And so we ended up having to, to sedate her and immediately popped right back in. Yeah, yeah once they get all loosey-goosey. Once they like, get loosey, yeah, it's yeah, easy, yeah. right? And this was the post, right? Now she can now Back she can to do normal. It. Yeah. So this was actually during the procedure. And yeah. I like to actually do this if I am sedating someone. I do yeah. it right then and there, right? Because I don't want to wait for chest X-ray. Yeah, I mean, right. Excuse me, shoulder X-ray. I do right. it right then and there. Mm -hmm. Now look at this alignment. Great. Here's our glenoid. Here's our humeral head. And you can see that nice articulation as we externally rotate. And it's moving nicely there. So awesome. nice post-reduction uh, ultrasound case. image there. This is like the perfect early pregnancy scan. It's exactly how it should be taught, I think. The first one that was done here was a sagittal view. You want to make sure that that gestational sac is in line with the vaginal canal here. That's how you know that that's actually inside the uterus. And that's important because you can have like a myometrial ectopic and yeah. it'll look like it's in the uterus, but it won't be in the center, it'll be off to the side. So brilliant first view. And also with this increased depth, you can actually like see if there's any significant free fluid down here. The peritoneum actually like goes down pretty deep. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I wanted to point out was this right here. Like if you're not careful, you might think that this is some free fluid. Whoever scanned this was like off to the side a little bit. If you threw colorful on that, I bet that that would just light up because it's very likely to be an iliac vessel. Yeah, absolutely. Next step, we got to decrease that depth a bit, right? Just yep. to be able to see because everything, all this down here, really, once we've identified it as being intrauterine, we don't need any of this down here, right? And then when we decrease the depth, 
we're actually making the image look better, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, so this is, I mean, it's pretty early pregnancy, right? I mean, I'm yeah. seeing a, I, I still think at the very beginning, I see a little remnant of a yolk sac. I think maybe. there is one. Like right yep. there, maybe. A yolk sac's still there. And then a little tiny baby down there. Yep. A little yeah. heartbeat going on. Yeah. And then uh, we definitely should use pulse wave Doppler. Yep. Right. Just to put more kind of energy to that baby. Oh. I thought you were being serious. Sorry about that, man. You mean no, no, M mode, okay. right? Yeah, that's what, that's what okay. I meant. <laughs> I know, it's, it's really weird too because, like, when like OB doctors, in my experience, they will use the pulse wave Doppler. It is like a little easier to see the heartbeat, but it's theoretically a higher. No, it's not theoretically. It is a higher energy, and there's a theoretical risk of harm. And we want to do like the Alara principle, which is like as low, was it as low as reasonably achievable? So you want yeah. the least amount of energy you can, just use M mode, right? Yeah, we don't need to use that power. Just use mm -hmm. M mode. It gives us the same info. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what we did here. So that's the other thing too, is that you remember you can move the M mode cursor. Um, it doesn't it always starts off right down the middle. You can move it off to the side and you just look for a little repetitive little thing right there. And that's the little baby heartbeat right there. And you measure it and use the same amount of energy as that B mode, which is great. This is perfect. This is a happy baby. Happy right? baby. 170 is, is good for first, early yeah. first trimester. So it's, 170 it's is great. I think we even measured the crown rump length in this case and mm -hmm. uh, put it at about nine weeks. Yeah. Uh, so happy nine week baby. Perfect. Yeah. Love it. So that is it for our first one. I'm excited about doing this as like a monthly thing. Is that cool? Yeah. All right. Let's, let's keep doing this, man. This is awesome. We should talk about our brand new residency. Yeah. Yeah. Let's so I actually, uh, when I was talking to Mike, I, I wasn't aware that a residency was going to start. So I was like very pleasantly surprised that I still get to work with residents. Um, the residency we're at is at Temecula Valley Hospital in Temecula, California. It is what, like an hour-ish uh, from the beach, maybe less if you go straight Probably across. Probably less than that. Yeah. 45? 45, I think. Okay. Yeah. I live like in between the beach and work. So it's like, it's great to be able to like go to the beach whenever I want. It's great mountain biking as well. Um, and I think we're accepting 10 per class, right? Yeah. 10 mm -hmm. residents every class. Yeah. We got the first 10 residents this year. Mm -hmm. They're awesome. Yeah. I think that everyone's super excited to have residents at the program. Yeah. 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 The environment's great, right? Way. Yeah. You know, we're, we're seeing sick patients. We're seeing um, a lot of variety of pathology. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, Jacob Avila here now. And Michael so, Macias. Uh, ultrasound people. Excited. Yeah. Uh, I definitely love recruiting more and more ultrasound faculty yeah. because, you know, I believe that point of care ultrasound is such a vital part of mm -hmm. our training. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're obviously more than just ultrasound at our site, but uh, I am really excited about the residents. And yeah. again, you know, we're happy to have you as part of the team. Thanks. No, I'm uh, very happy to be here. Um, yeah, check out the residency. I'll put a link to the residency website. Um, I guess right now, I'll just put it right now. There it is. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was our conference coming up. Yeah. Um, we have a conference called, is it Sound and Surf? I think it's Sound and Surf. I think we I, were I going Surf sometimes. and Sound or Sound yeah, and Surf, yeah, but yeah. I think we went with Sound and Surf. Yeah, and uh, it's going to be in person. It's going to be in San Diego, which is where Mike lives, really close to where the residency is at. Um, check out the URL for more information on that. And uh, in the meantime, make sure to check out thepocusatlas.com. Yep, and Core Ultrasound. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Mike, until next time. Until next time, man. It's All right, a pleasure. thanks so much. Yeah, right. likewise. Thanks, man.